Alright, um... We're a little bit behind lecture-wise, like maybe like a class or half a class behind, because I know you had the assignment about accessibility due last week, right? And uh, if you haven't gotten it turned in, uh, I'm not going to adjust the due dates or anything, but just get it in as soon as you can. So we're going to try to keep on schedule with this um, as we cover accessibility over the next uh, day or so. Um, does anyone have any project-related questions? You're welcome to send me your project before you turn it in, your project design before you turn it in, if you want me to give you feedback on it. Uh, I will tell you right now the feedback that I write on most of the ones, all right, not everyone, but most of the ones. Most of the issues is A, people forget a part. All right, so literally go through, and there's supposed to be five parts, Make sure there's five parts, include the fifth part being the prototype. So make sure you have five parts of it. If you want to help me out, number very largely. One, this is a strategy section. Two, this is a scope section. Believe it or not, I think most professors want to give points. It doesn't cost us anything to give you points, all right? So it's not like it's a precious, rare commodity, all right? I'd be happy if everyone did perfectly on this, all right? So when I take points off, it's not like I am doing it because I am happy about doing it, all right? I want everyone to succeed. I want everyone to do a good job. So make it easy on me. Clearly label it, all right? And that way, oh, okay, I didn't realize that that's what they thought was the scope section. And you might get at least some points for it, even if it's not accurate. Uh, One of the problems is, uh, one of the problems that I often say about the goals is the goals are too vague and or they simply restate basic design principles as opposed to something about your particular project. So for example, the site will be user friendly. That's not a goal. All right, That shouldn't be in the goal section. Because when would you not make your site user friendly? All right. Now, there are exceptions. Maybe if it's a mystery website or something like that, maybe you would make it tough and confusing. But for the most part, a standard website, yeah, you want it to be user friendly. Or it will be accessible. Yeah, every website you do should be accessible. Uh, it will have a good navigation. Yeah, it will. All right. Those are simply stating basic web design principles. That's like saying a goal is to spell all the words right, all right, in your term paper. All right, that's not a goal. <laughs> all right, that's like an assumption that that's going to happen. That's just doing the job correctly. A goal would be something specific to your content. So a goal might be something like uh, provide examples of three different styles of music, you know. Let's say you're doing a, a website on heavy metal, you know, do hair metal bands of the, you know, it will provide examples of, of these three subgenres, you know, hair metal, Scandinavian death metal, and the one that I've just seen making its rounds on Facebook, Mongolian metal, all right? That's actually really good. Yeah, that is very, yeah, it was good. Uh, so be specific. All right. Um, actually, what I regarded there would be more of a, uh, a, a requirement more than a goal. All right. Remember, a goal is what you want to achieve. So maybe your goal would be something like educate people on several subgenres of heavy, heavy metal music. That's what you hope when they visit your site that they accomplish. All right. And then a requirement might be include samples of these six subgenres or whatever. Yes. Um, when it comes to the goals, like, are the organization and user goals always different? They're 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 not they're not necessarily different. Sometimes they're the same thing written from different perspectives. You know, so you know, look at look at a site that was going to be educational. You know, if you put up a site and your aim is to educate people, people are going to come to the site probably with the aim to be educated, <laughs> right? So it's like they're complementary. Um, the, the, so
so the, the, the goal shouldn't be like in conflict. They should complement each other, although they won't necessarily be the same. For example, you know, if you're thinking of a band's website, um, a person's goal might be to get free music, all right, be able to listen to this band for free, get free music or whatever. That's probably not going to be the goal of the organization to provide free music maybe to provide samples of the music or something like that. So it's sort of related, but, you know, with a twist. And, 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 and from, again, like you said, a different perspective of the, the other party. Um, if the goals are totally off base, then, I don't know, that probably would be a problem. Yet, they're not going to be, like, identical either. So, I, you know, related probably or complementary is probably the best way to describe those. But be specific, talk about things specific to your content, not specific about web design, okay? We'll have a nice color scheme. No, that's, you know, okay, that's good. And that'll come out later on. I'm not saying it's not important, but ask yourself when you're defining the goals, are people gonna come to your site to see this? So if you say, if you put define as a goal to have good navigation, ask yourself, are people going to be visiting my site to admire how good my navigation is? And the answer is no, of course not. They're there for some information. All right? Or are people there to uh, examine uh, the color scheme and say, wow, those are the prettiest colors I've seen in my life? No, they're not there for that. You want that to be there, but that's not like a goal. Or that's not a requirement. That's not why people are coming to your site. And that's not the content that's going to help achieve those goals. So that, I would say that's sort of the biggest problem. Number one, make sure you hit everything. You know, a checklist and write it out with headings and subheadings. One, strategy, goals, user goals, organization goals, persona one, persona, make it easy on me. So I can look and say, yeah, they did everything. And if you slipped up on something and didn't do it correctly, at least I know you made the effort and maybe what you did would be worth a few points because maybe you did part of the job and not the whole job. All right. Uh, be sure to include the prototype. Remember, the prototype is HTML doc, you know, documents, HTML files, so you, and CSS files and maybe images. So you will have a document with the first four sections, like a Word document or a PDF document, and then you will have um, HTML files for the, f the, the fifth one, the prototype. Other questions? All right, excellent. Uh, this is a big, uh, you know, this is, is a big thing for the rest of the semester is, is the, uh, is the uh, project. Not to say the stuff that we're covering in class isn't important, but uh, the project stuff is always important. So if you have any questions about the project, if you think it's a question that will benefit uh, others in the class, by all means ask it in class. All right? Don't think, well, it's just my project. If, if it is something specific to your project, then we can look at it in lab. The other thing I would uh, encourage you to do, and I might even schedule a time to do this, is bring your projects to lab and share what you've done so far with other people. All right. A lot of times, you know, you probably have seen cases of this in, in other situations where you get sort of too close to the problem and, and you sort of have blinders on and you can only see it a certain way. And as soon as someone looks at it, someone else looks at it, they could provide you a fresh set of eyes and point out something that maybe you missed. I mean, that's true if you're writing a term paper with spelling. Right? You might look over the spelling, you know, a spelling mistake 10 times, and whereas someone else with fresh eyes might look and see it. That's, that's true with, with programming issues, right? If you have a bug in your program. Sometimes it's good just to call a person over and have them look at it. Sometimes even when you're explaining it to the other person, you'll find the problem. You know how many times has happened to me in my programming classes where a student says, I got this bug, and I'll come over, what's the problem? And they'll go and explain it, and they'll say, oh, okay, uh, it should say x equals 0, not x equals 1, or, or something goofy like that. Uh, and, you know, it's almost like, you know, the students start to think there's something magical about my powers 
that just the presence of me next to them solves that. And, and maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, but probably it's just, it forces them to look at it with fresh eyes. And if they can't find it, then a lot of times I can find it uh, quickly and, and help them get over the whatever problem they're having. So at any rate, share your projects with other people in the class. Learn from other people in the class. If someone did something really cool and you don't know how, ask them how they did it. All right? If, you know, they have a neat little transparency effect going on on the page and you like it. And you don't remember when we talked about that in class. Ask them, how would you do that? Or if you like the way their page is laid out, ask them, how did you do that? All right? That's fair game. All right. Accessibility. What do we mean when we talk about website accessibility? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, like for older versions, of, so you know, if you're on an older machine, you're able to access it as well. Now, there, there's a little bit of a graying of the line uh, of that. Typically, when we talk about accessibility, we're talking about disabilities. That's an important issue too, but usually that's called something else. That's usually called compatibility or backwards compatibility or, or something like that. So usually accessibility uh, is specifically about people with different abilities, disabilities, and so on. Uh, what are some of the, the disabilities that affect people trying to access content on the web? Blindness. Blindness is like number one, right? In fact, if you talk to some people, This often is the only one they think of, <laughs> all right? I, I will say it's my experience that web developers don't understand this topic well enough. That's why I always try to make a point to talk about it in my classes. The thought is, is that, um, you know, the web being so visual that that's the first thing that jumps to their mind. It's like, well, what if you can't see? And okay, yeah, fair enough, that's a good place to start, <laughs> all right, but that's not a good place to end. We're going to go beyond that, all right? Now, uh, in, in terms of making something accessible for people, uh, there are things, and there, there's actually things in the law about this, uh, to provide, uh, that, that people ought to provide reasonable accommodations, all right? All right, and reasonable accommodations often work along with assistive technology. And this is true in the real physical world as well as the world of the web. In the real physical world, the assistive technology could be a wheelchair. All right, that helps someone that, that, that can't walk, get around. What are some reasonable accommodations that you could make for someone in a wheelchair? Automatic doors. Automatic doors? Yeah. A ramp? Elevators. Elevator? Wide enough doors. Wide enough doors? These are all examples of reasonable accommodations. All right, so reasonable accommodations go hand in hand because without the reasonable accommodations, the assistive technology can be rendered far less effective or even, even useless. There wasn't an elevator to get up to the second floor. It would be real difficult for someone with uh, a wheelchair to get up here. All right? Or if there wasn't a ramp, or if the doors were narrow, or whatever. There weren't automatic doors. All right? So these things work hand in hand. And the one, without the reasonable accommodations, it can defeat assistive technology, which, which is a shame. All right? But they work hand in hand. All right, so we're going to think of this as we, as we survey the, uh, the um, different disabilities that are affected, uh, that affect someone's experience of being on the web. All right, so what is assistive technology as far as people that are blind? Screen readers. Screen readers. Now I'm going to try to get this to work, all right? There's something built into Windows as a screen narrator or screen reader, and there's one built into the Mac too. 
typically, a lot of people that have disabilities use like better uh, versions of the software, uh, better than the built-in one in there, but it can at least give you an idea what's going on. So let's try to bring this up and let's see what it does. I worked with a, uh, I worked uh, when I was, I did a NASA summer fellowship a bunch of years back and I worked with uh, uh, a high school student that was blind. Uh, I didn't work with her personally, we just shared the office because like in the summer they just put people wherever they can fit them, right? So I was an office mate with uh, a blind high school girl and it was amazing uh, to see the things that she could do. And every once in a while, if there was something in the software, she'd ask me, like, what's on her screen? But it was amazing coming in in the morning, because I'm not really a morning person, so I'd get in a lot later than her, all right? She would be in a room, dark, no, didn't turn the lights on, right? No point, if, if you're blind, to turn the lights on. Didn't even have her monitor on her screen. The monitor wasn't even on, but she'd be going away typing at a Word document or whatever. It was really, really amazing and really a tribute to... Uh, what someone can do if you just give them uh, the tools that they need to get around some of these uh, obstacles that they have. Um, the, the person, uh, they were mentored by a person that worked uh, uh, at NASA full-time, and I don't remember her name, but I do remember, and this is bad on me, but her uh, guide dog was named Cadet. All right, because there was a sign on her door that said cadet, and then it had her name. And I thought that was her rank. I thought, well, she's a cadet. I don't, I don't know what that means, but she's a cadet, you know. Then I re realized later, oh, that's the name of her guide dog, and her guide dog got a nameplate on the, on the thing. All right, so let's go and turn on the screen reader. And she said, if you really want to test out for something, you really want the experience, turn off your monitor and unplug your mouse. Because guess what? If you're blind, you can't use the mouse to navigate. All right? You can't go and click on something. You don't know where it is on the screen. So let's go. Uh, control panel. Let's see. What is it called here? Ease of access, thank you. And there's a few other assistive technologies. One is an on-screen magnifier, that if you turn that on, it's like a little magnifying glass that you can view and see the screen bigger. Uh, when I was um, a DJ at WOBC, uh, the uh, Oberlin College uh, station, the uh, person that was there like two shifts before me, like not the shift immediately before me, but the shift uh, before me was someone that had very bad vision and they used a screen magnifier just to read it. All right, okay, here's a narrator. And I hope the volume works. Let's try this. Working on piece of access center, start on screen keyboard, button, all plus get piece of access center. Set up high contrast, button, Alt plus Q, start magnifier, button, Alt plus G, magnifier enlarges part of the screen. It's telling you what start some of the... Narrator, button, Alt plus N, I'll, narrator reads. I'll turn it on and off as, as we need, need it. Uh, it told you not just what the button was, and if you're on a button, if you hit, spa if you hit the space bar, that will click the button. All right? Uh, also, if you notice, it said real quickly what the keyboard shortcut was for some of the things. Because again, you can't navigate with the mouse. You can't click on the button. You can use your mouse to select the button by like tabbing over to certain places on the screen. I'm going to cheat. And you can hit the space. <clears throat> if you want to select it. All right. So let's go to a website. I'll turn the volume.
volume back on. This would have to be excruciating if you had a screen reader to get the screen pop up. Space. I'll hit space. Lorraine County Community College. Real education. Real jobs. A real future. Lorraine County Community College. Real education. Real jobs. A real Lorraine County Community College. Real education. Notice a link came up that said skip the content. A real future. Skip to content. Why? What is that for? That is for is going to narrate every time through all those navigation links at, uh, at the beginning. And if you're on a page and you don't want the navigation links to be read to you for the 15th time, you can click the, you can select the uh, skip to content link and go to right to the content area of that. That's a useful sort of navigation thing. Now, when you hear this, you might think that, wow. That would be next to impossible to navigate a web page through and try it on your own. It, it is difficult, but keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, there are products better than this, all right, that offer more control and are a little more user friendly and so on. Secondly, if this was the only way you could do it, you'd make it work, right? Just like it's unimaginable to me that uh, people that are blind can navigate around the campus, you know, even this campus. Uh, and again, the high school student, I got lost at NASA, but she was able to find, she took a bus in, was able to find uh, the room and the building and all that. Because if you have to do it a certain way, you'll learn how to do it that way. All right. Um, there was a guy a few years back that, uh, that was blind that filled the vending machines. I don't know if, if you've been here for a few semesters, maybe you've seen him. But he would go and he would take and he'd fill the chips and the pop and all that. And he would go and he would it'd make his way around. And it's, it's, it's really amazing. But again, you know, it's, it's a testimony that people will do what they need to do uh, under the circumstances to, to, to you know, to, to survive and to, to get whatever they need to do done. Okay? So, if you think that's hard, again, it's the only option for people that are blind. Now, notice a few things about this. There was a skip navigation link that we could do. There was uh, that you could choose and skip over reading the navigation to you for the 15th time. There was a um, the images on the page, the alt text attribute was read to you. Again, it doesn't tell you exactly what the image is but it can give you some information about the image on the page. All right? So those are the reasonable accommodations. Those are a couple of the reasonable accommodations that you can do on a web page. Some of the other reasonable accommodations, and I might have even said this on some of your assignments that you have done. All right? Make the wording for the link descriptive. So don't say resource one. What does resource one mean? All right. Don't say click here for information. Say link to usability.gov for accessibility guidelines. Make sure your link text is descriptive because that's what the screen reader is going to read to people. And you can use the tab key to tab through the links that exist on a page. If all the links were simply click here, click here, click here, click here, you would be able to keep track of it. But if the links were descriptive enough and told you what the web page was, then you have the person that's accessing it has a fighting chance. Then you're working with the uh, assistive technology and providing reasonable accommodations instead of working against it. All right. So all attributes, meaningful text for links, skip navigation or skip to content links. All these things are things that you can do to help the reasonable accommodations be able to access uh, the site. All right. Now, 
there's some other assistive technologies too, on-screen on keyboard. I worked with a student many years ago that had uh, neurological uh, issues, and I'm not sure exactly what their physical condition was, but they had a very hard time like using their arms to type on the keyboard. They weren't like totally paralyzed, but they had very limited motion. And they would use the on-screen keyboard. And it's just like a regular keyboard, except it's kind of like a phone keyboard, where you go and you pick and click on it, as opposed to uh, typing on an actual keyboard. Um, high contrast would be another thing that could be done. Now, I want to make a couple important points here, because we've considered blindness, and we talked about some of the reasonable accommodations that we can do that work with the assistive technology. But I want to make a couple of points that we're going to come back to uh, over and over again. Uh, number one, we have to make the reasonable accommodations so that we don't, so that we work with the assistive technology. That's point number one. Number two, one of the ways that you make your site more accessible is provide the same content different ways. All right. Let me give you an example of that. We talked about an image and the alt attribute. That is, that is supplying the content two different ways. There's a picture and there's words. So if you can't access one, then you can access the other. So that is a way. So multiple presentation of the same content is a way that you can make your site more accessible. All right? Another key point, let me, I should be writing these up on the board. If we're going to prepare some accessibility guidelines, and I know everyone's thinking, why didn't I do this before the assignment was due? All right. But if we're going to make some general guidelines. Number one, the reasonable accommodations. are needed for assistive technology to be effective. Number two, multiple ways of Showing content and functionality. So an alt attribute, allowing someone to use a mouse or use a keyboard. Keyboard shortcuts are an example of accessibility, right? Uh, and that's not just on web pages, but on any application, right? If you're in Word, if you want to print something, control P or alt P or something like that, right? Well. You can also click the menu. Well, a blind person doesn't have that option. But since we've provided a couple ways to do it, there's a way for them to do it. So have multiple ways of displaying the content, of showing the content. Um, I shouldn't use the word show. I should say of representing the content. And for providing functionality. So keyboard shortcuts along with being able to use the mouse to do certain things. A third one, which doesn't really come into play here, is the notion of simplicity. And we'll come into that later on. I guess if you were on a page that was very, very, very cluttered, the screen reader would go crazy, and it would be very difficult to work its way through. Whereas if the screen was designed more simply, it would be easier to navigate with the screen reader. Now, here's another important principle, all right, that accommodations can benefit those without the
win-win situation, right? How many of you use keyboard shortcuts when you're doing stuff? All right, well, you're not disabled, <laughs> all right? So that's a combination that, that, that's a feature of the program that works for people that are disabled and makes them able to do something that they couldn't otherwise do. But you know what? It's beneficial for people that don't have those disabilities as well, all right? It's kind of like the elevator, right? The elevator allows someone in a wheelchair to get from the first floor to the second floor. But it also helps people that maybe are carrying a heavy uh, bag of books and, and they don't want to go up the steps. Or someone that has health issues and they don't want to walk up the steps. Or leg injuries. and uh, Or someone that just had a bad morning and don't feel like facing the steps all right, at uh, first thing in the day. All right? So the accommodations that you do for people with disabilities oftentimes can benefit the people without the disabilities. And at the very least, usually, if they don't benefit people, they don't get in their way. All right? For example, let's, let, me, let me verify that this is true before I make a statement. How many of you noticed that on the room number out there, there's Braille? I just assumed it was there. You just assumed it was there? You didn't notice? Maybe you did notice. Did it bother you? Did you say, I can't read the sign that says this is BU-205 because there's some dots underneath it? No, right? So maybe you don't even notice the accommodations, like skip navigation link, all right? You can actually hide those links so that someone that can see doesn't see those links, or doesn't see the skip navigation link. You may never see an alt attribute, but it doesn't get in your way. It doesn't really hurt things. So even if it doesn't help people that don't have those uh, particular disabilities, at the very least, it doesn't hurt either. You just ignore it if you don't need it. Uh, you may never need the elevator, all right? You may uh, want to get your steps in on your Fitbit, right? So you're going to take the steps going upstairs. Well, the fact that there's an elevator over there doesn't really get in your way, all right? doesn't make it more difficult for you, all right? And that's an important consideration. You will hear some people incorrectly say that accessibility is a problem because by making the site accessible, you make the site, you might make the site less exciting or less interesting, and that is nonsense, all right? These accommodations will either be transparent to someone that doesn't have that disability, or in some cases will help them as well, all right? So don't be concerned about, well, if I make the site accessible, I am going to make it a less exciting or a less robust or less rich site. I had a student years ago that it was one of those things that like, oh, this one really gets my goat, as they say. I didn't even have a goat until then, but when he said it, I got a goat and he got my goat, all right? And they said, well, why should I not put video on my site just because a certain percentage of people are blind, all right? That's a total misunderstanding of accessibility. Accessibility principles wouldn't say don't put video on your site because there's some people that are blind, right? Accessibility principles would say, well, people are blind, unfortunately won't be able to see the video, but they can still hear it. Depending on what the video is, it might be beneficial for them, all right? Perhaps you could include a summary that would help them, all right? if it wasn't obvious what was going on. So you could make some accommodations uh, about the video uh, for people uh, that uh, weren't able to see it. You could possibly include text for that. Or for people that can't hear, you could include a transcript of, let's say there's an interview between two people, you could include a transcript between those people. And again, it's a case of multiple presentation, right? You have the audio and video of the interview, and then you have a transcript of it. And you know what? Someone that's deaf isn't going to be able to hear, but they can read the transcript, 
or they can read the captioning on the video. That's another example of multiple presentation. And you know what? Sometimes I would rather read an interview than hear the interview. Because I can read really quick, all right? And I can look and maybe read through the interview and see if I want to listen to it or not, or read through part of it or listen to it. Or if you're in a lab and there's no speakers on there, all right, or in a library and you have to be quiet, it can help people, even people that don't have a particular disability. Now, here's another characteristic of accessibility, and that is that there's extreme, for, for every disability, there's sort of extreme cases of it, and then there are less severe versions of that same disability. And that broadens the scope of who needs accessibility. Because again, some people that are ignorant will say, well, there's X percentage of people in the world that are blind. Why should we do all these accommodations just for them? Well, number one is the right thing to do, right? I mean, you wouldn't open a store that kept people that are in wheelchairs out of your store, right? You wouldn't be able to, right? And the law is not clear, and I'm not a lawyer, all right? But you may be legally bound, especially for certain kinds of websites, to provide accessibility. And if you're not legally bound by the ADA, you can be sued for it. There was a case of Target being sued for their website not being accessible a bunch of years ago. All right? So even if you don't aren't legally bound to it, it's not a good thing to do. All right? So do it. You know, you can be motivated for doing the right thing, or you can be motivated by keeping yourself out of trouble. But in any case, you know, work to make your site accessible. But if you need further convincing, consider that for every disability, there's sort of like slight variations of the disability that also can require accommodations. So blindness is probably the most severe visual disability that there is, where you simply can't see. What are some sort of related vision conditions that aren't blind, but, you know, hey, might compromise your ability to navigate through the web? Colorblindness. Is there anyone in here colorblind? I think I asked that before. No. What's another one? Visually impaired. Yeah, visually impaired. Where you can see, but you don't see particularly well. All right? And that can range from people who can have a vision but are legally blind to people that simply have very poor eyesight to a continuum. Uh, this one especially, and we'll find a lot of these conditions, unfortunately, come into a play as people age. All right? So people that are older typically have diminished eyesight. So almost all the ones, all the disabilities we talk about, there is sort of age-related implications for it. So just because you're old doesn't mean you can't see, but typically you don't see as well. Uh, just because you're older doesn't mean that you can't hear, but your hearing isn't as good as when you were younger. Uh, you may still have motor control of your hands, but you might have arthritis. You might have certain neurological conditions where your hands shake and other things. So there's a whole range of disabilities that are related to sort of the major disabilities that we talk of. All right? And we ought to address them. How can we address colorblindness on our site? Okay. Well, they could. That's one thing they could do. But on our website, you can design it. In high you can design it with uh, with good contrasting colors. Does that mean that every site you do should be in black and white? No. Just make sure it's not green on yellow or orange on red. 
or something like that. And I'm pretty sure I've seen all of these color combinations actually used. Now, color blindness, in a way, is uh, a misnomer because color blindness, people are color blind, don't see just in black and white. There are just the inability to distinguish between certain pairs of colors. And if you want to know how your site looks, there's actually color blindness filters so that you can pull up and you can look and see, well, if someone visited my site and they suffer from color blindness, this is how the page would look. So, let's try to pull this up. they do it with photos and this is a good demonstration there are similar ones that work for websites so this is what a normal person a uh, person with normal vision would see this uh, looks like a pile of crayons so if you had word I can't pronounce word I can't pronounce you might see it this way if your red was weak if your green was weak, you might see it this way. If your blue was weak, you might see it that way. If you have this kind of color blindness, you'd see it look like that. And a few other options as well. All right. On this, you could, you could actually upload a screenshot of your... In fact, let's do that. Let's pull up a website. Uh, shift print screen. upload our image did I pass it So I could upload a screenshot of your website and say, hey, how does this look? There we go. All right. If I have that, well, I can still read everything, right? The blues are a little weak compared to that. They're not quite as vivid. But it's certainly functional. Right? There's no way you can make people be able to see it as someone with normal vision would see. But it should at least be legible. There's a monochromatic view. There everything looks more greenish. There's also a, a color blindness fil filter that will allow you to visit a website. And, yeah, web page filter. So I could go in, and this shows a web page. And to make it easy, they showed a, a site that has a lot of color. Uh, and you can see the difference between it. Those little things that are color blindness tests. They show you how a colorblind person would see that. Or you can go to 
any site that you want. Problem with these is since it's doing it live and it's retrieving all those images and converting all of them, this could be more time consuming than where I took a screenshot and did that. But again, it, it does work. All right, there is the normal view. Here's a view for people that have that kind. And again, looks a little different, but it's still readable. All right. What about people that just have bad eyes? What about people that just have bad vision? Magnifier. The screen magnifier would be thing. Being The browser has assistive technology in that you can zoom the screen. I can go in my browser and do this if I want. But guess what? It would be nice if my page is responsive and it works in that small layout. All right. And it's, it's typical things. Even on the default setting, don't make it, don't make the font too small. Give adequate space between the links. Make the link targets big enough. It's pretty well common sense. This brings up a couple other principles of good web accessibility. Some, not all, is just common sense, basic, good web design. What people that even have perfect vision want a page with tiny print that's very cluttered? No one does. No one benefits from that. All right? So, you can do it for accessibility reasons. You can do it because it's a smart thing to do. All right? But the effect is the same. Another one is, where possible, custom, customizable is good. Let's say I had choices between color schemes for my website, all right? Where I think you can even do it in Canvas, right? You can pick your default color scheme. Uh, well, if you're colorblind, um, you might be able to pick a color scheme that works best for you. Um, <clears throat> if you're not colorblind, you're happy because you pick your favorite colors, <clears throat> right? So again, a win-win situation. Um, okay, let's see what time it is. We got two minutes left. This is going to be the rarest of all days. I'm going to end a couple minutes early. All right. What we'll do next time is we will wrap up. And I want to start with these things, these rules. And... I'm going to post them to Canvas, and we'll talk about other disabilities from the framework of these things. Like, what are multiple ways of representing content if you're deaf? What are milder versions of deafness? And so on. Customizable is good. How does that come into play? All right. That's all I have for today. I'll go unlock the lab, and then I'll be back in lab.